Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, my name is Simon Wright, and I am the Director of Programming at Japan House London. And welcome to today's online event, Witness to the 1964 Olympic Torch Relay, How the Olympic Flame Brought Excitement and Hope to Asia. The event is held alongside Japan House London's current exhibition, Tokyo 1964, Designing Tomorrow, which explores the pioneering design and architecture of the Tokyo 1964 Olympic Games and is on display at Japan House until the 7th of November, 2021. This exhibition includes a number of items relating to the torch relay, including the Olympic torch and torch holder designed by Yanagi Sori and the uniform worn by torch relay runners. Before we start, I would like to give a brief explanation of some housekeeping rules. So please note that your microphone and webcam will be disabled for the entire duration of the event. Uh, please use the question and answer feature to type uh, any of the questions that you have for our presenters at any time throughout the session. If you do not want to ha have your name attached, uh, you may ask your question anonymously. Questions will be collected by members of Japan House and a selection will be answered live at the end of the event. Please note that we may not be able to answer all questions during this session. And lastly, please note that the contents of this event will be streamed live on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn, where a recording will be archived later. So today's event explores the journey of the Tokyo 1964 Olympic torch across Asia. To tell this story, we are broadcasting live from London, where I am, and Tokyo in Japan with two very special guests. Author Roy Tomizawa will first provide an introduction to the special significance and power of the Tokyo 1964 torch relay. And then he will be joined in conversation with our very special guest today, Kuno Akiko, who was a member of the Overseas Olympic Torch Relay Mission in 1964 and traveled with the flame for 10 days on its journey from India to Okinawa. At the end, we will have some time to answer some questions uh, submitted by our guests through the question and answer function on Zoom. So please do send in your questions throughout the event. Also, Beth and Jones will be joining us later to provide interpretation assistance during the question and answer session. So to begin, I would like to introduce our first guest, Roy Tomizawa. Hello, Roy. Hi there. Great Hello. to be here. Good to Thank see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's it's a great honor, and I'm I'm glad to be doing this. No, oh, thank you very much. I'll just tell uh, our viewers a little bit uh, about about you, if I may. So, Roy sure. is the author of the book 1964: The Greatest Year in the History of Japan: How the Tokyo Olympics Symbolized Japan's Miraculous Rise from the Ashes. He has a strong personal connection to the 1964 Games, in fact. He celebrated his first birthday on the opening day of the 1964 Olympic Games. His father worked with the NBC news crew that broadcast those games to homes in the United States. A former print journalist from New York, Roy is currently a leadership and talent development consultant from New York with over 30 years experience in Asia. Roy, thank you so much. It's, it's, it's a great privilege to have you with us today, and uh, we thank you very much. And I will hand over to you, if I may. Thank you, Simon. It is a great honor. And uh, with all the hoopla of Tokyo 2020 done, um, you know, it seems like the last chance to really talk about Tokyo 1964 this year. Hopefully we'll have other opportunities in the future, but grateful to London House, uh, to Japan House in London to, to put on that exhibition. I wish, I could be there. <laughs> oh, we do too. We do too. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll share the screen and uh, explain. Uh, I'd set up uh, the uh, session we're going to have with Kuno-san, but I... Uh, can you see this? The... Wait a second. Sorry, one more time. Let me try again. That's the screen I want to share. Okay, sorry. So um, 
this looks like any other glorious opening ceremony of an Olympics, and, and it was. It was October 10th, 1964, which was a beautiful autumn day. Um, this scene is just as Team Japan is entering the National Stadium during the parade of athletes. Um, then there are speeches from officials, the raising of the Olympic flag uh, brought from Rome to Tokyo, uh, the releasing of 10,000 balloons and the lighting of the Olympic cauldron. Uh, it was also my birthday, as Simon had mentioned. I had turned one on that day, but my father wasn't with me on my first birthday. He was in Tokyo. Uh, he's the Asian looking guy. And uh, he was helping NBC News broadcast the Olympic Games live to America. And so the opening day of the Tokyo Olympics has always had a special meaning for me, especially since I moved to Japan. Um, October 10th uh, became a public holiday. Uh, so for many years, my birthday was always a day off. Uh, that's not true anymore. They changed the dates, but before it was always on October 10th. Uh, but more importantly, of course, that they had special meaning for the Japanese beyond the thrills of hosting a global event. It was special because of where the Japanese had come in, in only 19 years. Um, so this is a picture of a, an American swimmer, Dick Roth. Now, Dick Roth was in Tokyo, of course, during the Olympics, but, uh, and so at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, he was only 17 years old. And uh, he won gold in the grueling 400 meter individual medley. Uh, the individual medley is when you, you go 50 meters each in the different disciplines uh, of swimming from you know breaststroke to backstroke to butterfly to um, freestyle. Uh, so it's a very, I'm sorry, 100 meters each. And so it's a very tough race. It's painful. Um, but so he was... Uh, he was supposed to compete early in the Olympics and then suddenly he got in terrible pain and he was told by doctors that he had to have his appendix removed and so he was told that he can't compete in the Olympics but he was a kid and he was excited and he, he just begged his parents to convince them to let him compete to hold off the surgery to later and he won the gold medal and he, he became an Olympic legend at that time but that's not the story I want to tell. I mean, this was not his first time in Japan. So four years earlier, when he was 13 years old, he he first came to Japan with the U.S. swim team. There was some exhibition in 1960. And toward the end of his, uh, uh, end of his stay in Japan, the team went to Nikko, you know, the beautiful resort town uh, not far from Tokyo in Tochigi. And while walking through the woods, I suppose near near the, the temple with, with the team, he he saw something he clearly remembers today. He said, "You know, I wandered off on my own, which was a habit I have when I travel, skipping the handlers. And I was walking back to the lodge, and I came face to face with a group of eight to ten horribly disfigured children of of my age, probably older. And he said they were from Nagasaki and Hiroshima." Um, later, I talked with one of my handlers and asked about them, and he said they were also on a tour. Uh, I was shocked and horrified to think anyone could do anything so, so barbaric. I mean, I know we dropped the bomb to shorten the war, but it was such a visceral feeling I will never forget. So that was 1960, and then 1964, he told me the story of October 10, 1964, uh, the day before his appendix exploded in pain. And he described the moment the, of the lighting of the Olympic torch, right? He told me, he said this, the torchbearer came in and there was cheering and a kind of reverence. I don't, I don't know what to call it. The attention was locked on this individual. I was stunned by the switch in the crowd. He got to the top and turned around 
it, it was like another one of those moments that defies description. When he stood there and held the torch high, I was stunned. So as many of you might know, that torchbearer was named Yoshinori Sakai. He was a Waseda student. He was a competitive 400 meter sprinter, uh, but he did not make the Japan Olympic team. Um, he, he did have another very interesting qualification. He was born in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, um, the day, of course, an atomic bomb was dropped on his city. So think about this symbolism. The most significant moment of the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, with the biggest worldwide audience ever at that time, the Japanese organizers chose to remind people of America's role in one of the most devastating wartime acts in history. Um, many of you know the renowned American translator Edwin Seidensticker. Um, he's translated a lot of great Japanese class literature classics. And he was reported to have objected to the selection of Sakai saying, this was unpleasant to Americans. But uh, by most other witnesses, particularly Olympians I interviewed, that was a powerful and positive moment, a symbol of peace and Japan's resiliency. And if you think about it, for the Japanese to promote this symbolism, it showed a, a growing level of confidence. I mean, only 12 years after the Allied forces led by the United States, States ended its occupation of Japan. So there's Sakai, right? Sakai. He's climbed these steps with the Olympic torch in his right hand. The torch is based at shoulder height and the cylinder sparking reddish white and spewing smoke, 20 steps, 40 steps, 60 steps. You know, Sakai held an even pace as he jogged up the stairway to the top of the national stadium, 140 steps, 160 steps. And finally, after 163 steps, climbing the equivalent of basically an eight-story building without a slip or a stumble, you know, Sakai stood next to this large black cauldron. He faced the crowd and he cracked a smile. Was it a smile of relief at making it to the top without spilling? Was it exhileration upon seeing the field filled with over 5,000 athletes from 93 nations and a stadium with over 70,000 cheering spectators, including the emperor of Japan. I mean, certainly those were two of the many feelings all of Japan felt that beautiful autumn afternoon on October 10th, 1964, when Japan welcomed the world to the 18th Olympiad. Sakai had just done what Japan had done over the previous 19 years, symbolically climbed a mountain. I mean, prior to the opening ceremonies, the torch had also come a long way. As is tradition, the Olympic flame started its journey in Athens, Greece. And today, the torch goes directly from Greece to the host country. But in 1964, the tradition was for the torch and the Olympic flame to wend its way on an international relay. In 1964, the Olympic flame traveled 16,240 kilometers. And as you can see, uh, before the flame landed in Okinawa, it made its way from Athens to Istanbul, Beirut, Tehran, Lahore, New Delhi, Rangoon, as it used to be called, Bangkok, KL, Manila, Hong Kong, and Taipei before it made its way to Okinawa. So 1964 was a very exciting time in Japan. It was a time of youthful energy, of endless possibility. Japanese were working hard, but also playing hard. They were dancing to the Beatles, swooning over Steve McQueen and Natalie Wood in the movie theaters, bowling in Shinagawa, filling baseball stadiums, and dreaming of having my car and my home. With the Olympics in town, the sky felt like it was the limit. And one of those young Japanese dreamers was Akiko Kuno. So our guest 
she knows all about that. She, she lived that. Kuno-san was a 24-year-old Japanese woman working in the Olympic Organizing Committee's Public Relations Department. And she was selected as a member of the Overseas Olympic Torch Relay Mission. Uh, she joined that mission from India and was witness to one of the most powerful exercises of Japanese soft power as she accompanied the sacred flame through Burma, Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And fortunately, she is here with us today. Hey, hi, Kuno-san. You have to unmute. Okay. Hi, nice <laughs> to see you again, Roy. <laughs> It's so great. It's it's uh, it's been a I don't know about several months since we first met, but it feels like I've known you a long time already. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, so we have you know 20, 30 minutes to have a conversation about your incredible experiences uh, in uh, Asia, uh, of course, also in Tokyo. Um, so you, you, were, you, you went to uh, uh, university in Japan, but you also went to school in America. Um, and then you ended up with your first major job in the Tokyo Olympics. So um, why don't we just start with, you know, how did you get involved in the 1964 Tokyo Olympics? And, you know, uh, what were your main tasks when you first started? Okay, that's a good question to start with, Roy. Uh, can you imagine that 57 years have passed since the 1964 Tokyo Games, Olympic Games? Please do not blame on me if I don't remember all the details. <laughs> well, I think it was in 1959 in Munich that Tokyo won the ticket to hold the Olympics in 1964. At that time, I was just a freshman in the university and was not interested in the Olympics at all because like most Japanese people, I thought it impossible and too early to have the Olympics in Tokyo as it was only 15 years after the Pacific War and we are politically unstable and economically we were poor. Mm. However, in 1963, when an eye-catching and stunning Olympic emblem designed by Kamekura Yusuke was mm. introduced, the whole nation got excited about the idea of hosting the Olympics first held in Asia. Now, the Japanese people were able to share the common national goal. We thought that if we successfully accomplished the Tokyo Olympics, we could make an impressive recovery from the devastating uh, situation from the war. Yeah. So in April, in 1964, for when I graduated university, I applied for the job at the Olympic Organizing Committee and was accepted into the public, relation, public relations department, which dealt with officials from the IOCs and International Sports Federations. I took them on tours of various venues in Tokyo where building construction was still going on to complete in time for the Olympic. Tange Kenzo's famous Yoyogi Stadium was completed only in August 31st. Oh, only, really? Yes, <laughs> one month and a half before the opening day. Uh, let me... Let me show you my ID pass issued for the staff of the public relations department so that I could go into the, any venues without buying tickets. 
So <laughs> this is my treasure. <laughs> and another job I also coordinate with domestic and foreign correspondents to provide them with a news resource on Olympic. In those days, you may wonder about the Japanese woman situation in the society. Well, the situation was nothing like what it is today. Unless you were in financial need, it was normal for women to get married early 20s. Mm. Most Japanese women did not dare to go to college as they are afraid they might be unsold for the marriage. We say, ure no kori. <laughs> and, but um, I had a very, uh, I was fortunate to have very enlightened and understanding parents who had let me study at the college in the US in my junior year and did not uh, interfere with what I want to do in future. By working in the Olympics, I wanted to challenge myself and applied knowledge and experience, what I had acquired in the college. And I was rather comfortable in my department as my, most of my colleagues um, were just similar experience like me, you know, studying abroad or came back to Japan as a returnee. So mm. I was rather comfortable in the Olympic Organizing Committee. That's that great. answer your question? Yeah, but th th you were, were you the only uh, young woman working there or were there a lot of other young no, women? No, we have uh, four a young woman like me working for the uh, public creation department. Of course, we have men working with yeah. us, but we seem to over dominate the, the department. Sometimes women are stronger than men. <laughs> <laughs> you know, before I go to my next question, I, I always wonder, did you meet my father? It's possible. No. You know, it's no. possible. <laughs> <laughs> possible. <laughs> Well, because because you said you worked with the press, you worked with the well, news mostly uh, Japanese press, but sometimes foreign oh, press came into our office. Okay. Well, speaking of the foreign uh, side of your work, um, of course, the reason one of the reasons we're talking is that you were a part of a team that oversaw the torch relay uh, that took part overseas. Of course, it was first from Athens through. Uh, international uh, nations, and then it came to Japan. Uh, but so you were a witness uh, of the to the torch relay from India to Okinawa. So um, tell us about what you did. What was a, a typical day in the torch relay in, in Asia that you saw? What was the mission? What, what did you do? Okay. Well, I think I'm the only ones who are still alive from the mission members. Is that right, should, really? <laughs> yes, because I was the youngest okay. and only 24 years, 24 years old. So I should say that I'm the only survival <laughs> from the mission member. Well, I was assigned to be the member of the overseas torture relay mission to pay an official courtesy call to hosting cities in Asia and to oversee the operation of the international torture relay to be properly conducted in each city without extinguish the sacred Olympic flame lit from the sun in Olympus, Greece until the final destination of Okinawa. And I was the only female member in the mission. My role was an English interpreter, as most of most members of the mission could not speak English. We flew on DC-6B, which is propeller plane called City of Tokyo. On the plane, there were two specially designed flame holders in which the sacred flame from Greece were always burning. 
at every airport. After the small official ceremony, the chairman of the Overseas Olympic Torch Relay Mission lights the torch from the flame holder and pass it on to the uh, local dignitary uh, who light the torch of the first relay runner and then the actual relay starts accompanied by many official runners and official cars as far as the national stadium of the country or sometimes a city hall where the sacred flame is kept burning until the next day when the sacred torch is relayed back to the airport to visit the next city. Um, I have to tell the exciting memory of the actual relay. Um, in almost every city, the roads were filled with thousands of spectators who are eager to watch the Olympic flame. I don't know that fuel, not I, I'm sorry, they don't know that fuel in the torch will last only six minutes so that torch runner must pass it on to the next runner with six minutes. Uh, in case the sacred flame died out, well, if it never happened as far as I know, I was <laughs> always in the car behind the torch runner holding the spare flame holder uh, please show the flame of the uh, slide of the uh, spare flame holder. Yes, this is the one that I always hold it in the car like my baby. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, this is about this height and about this round. Okay. When I saw crowds of spectators, cheering with excitement and enthusiasm and began blocking the torch runner, I opened the car window and shouted in English because I am an interpreter. So please, please get away. The flame will go out in six minutes. But people did not care and did not listen to me. So I shouted again, in Japanese, doite, doite, seika wa roppun de kiete shimaimasu, onegai desu. I don't know why, but it works better in Japanese. <laughs> That's my experience. <laughs> and so your mission was to make sure that, you know, each, each step of the way was completed in time so that the flame never goes out, right? I mean, did the flame ever go out? Never go out, as far as I know. I don't know about the incident in the domestic, in the Jap when they arrived in Japan, because they relayed from the four different spots from the uh, Japanese island. So I don't know, I didn't observe what happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, not my responsibility. <laughs> okay. Um, but you also had some you you because you were you it was a big team right it's it's quite a lot of people people who worked for JAL people worked for the organizing committee yes uh, and and All you together, were, the, were you the only one that spoke English <laughs> uh, I I think so some maybe some press uh, contact they he speaks a little bit. But I'm afraid I was the only one who could handle the English. Even the leader of the mission didn't speak English at all. In those days, Jap most Japanese couldn't speak good English unless they you lived in overseas or studied in for uh, overseas different right. country. Okay. So then, basically, you met everybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> So you, you basically at these at these uh, ceremonies, you would meet uh, the head of the country or the head of the city or some uh, well, great official of that area, like right? a mayor, mayor of the city, or but sometimes we were 
uh, greeted by the top of the uh, Olympic Organized Committee members. Mm. So you went through many uh, cities uh, and, and before I met you, I always wondered, this was only 19 years after the end of World War II in Asia. And, you know, you had this torch relay in countries that were, that were battlefields uh, during the war, like the Philippines, uh, for example. Um, you know, even even other countries. You know, all the countries Singapore. Well, Singapore wasn't in the relay, but Thailand was was impacted, and you know, all of those countries were impacted in some way. And of course, there was there was fighting in other countries. So, you know, I you see the uniforms of the torch relay holders. It's a a white jersey with the red circle, and to people living in those areas, it, it must have seemed like that was the Japanese flag again, right? It, it looked like the Japanese flag, which of course looked like the Japanese flag they saw during the wartime period. <laughs> the so war. so the, the question I have is, you know, what was the reception that the, uh, the Japanese mission had throughout Asia, at least the parts that you, were, you saw? What, what was it like? Because I can imagine sometimes it's, it's positive and maybe sometimes it's negative. Well, I was also very worried about how the torch would be received and how we mission member from Japan would be accepted into those Southeast Asian countries where Japan gave a hard and difficult time to the peoples during the World War II. However, once the relay actually started, it turned out to be only my, uh, my own anxiety. I was, as you said, I was overwhelmed by the fact that all Tochi relay runners, young men and women, proudly put on their uniform, donated from the Tokyo Olympic Organizing Committee with Hinomaru, and Olympic logo. I believe that the Olympic flame carried by the young torch runners in Asia gave the dream and hope that maybe one day the Olympics might be held in their own countries. They saw that even Japan could make an impressive recovery from the devastating devastation since the end of the war just 19 years before. Mm. Yes. And when when you traveled through Asia, the, the people who carried the torch, they were all uh, sort of uh, what teenagers? They were they were they were no, young. Um, well, variety of ages, I think, but most of them belong to some kind of sports organization or high school men and women, but actually they were young, maybe mm. under 30s, I don't know. And they were they were donated the 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 outfit and the sneaker, the yes. shoes. Did they keep the not shoes? Shirt? Because oh, shoes, shoes, it's difficult to fit into each individual. Right. Yeah. I mean, and torch. You, oh, they they were allowed to keep the torch. No, torch were also donated from Japan. Okay. The, okay. And did you did you have any memories of meeting uh, any of the torch relays in any of the countries? Do you have any good memories of 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 talking to them? Yes. Uh, while they are running on the street, we don't have time to speak each other. But when they say goodbye to us at the airport, I had some uh, opportunity to speak with them. And they all said, see you again in Tokyo at the Olympic time. That's just, uh, I was so happy to see them again. And I think I met one. Uh, oh, you did? Yes, uh, from the Thailand. I think they realized that he met me during the torture oh. relay. I'm sorry, I didn't remember his face. I was so busy <laughs> involving <laughs> other business, but he came to me and 
hi, you remember you met me <laughs> during the Tochi Relay. Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful, yes. So then you, you, you came, you traveled through, uh, you made it to Taiwan. There was, there was an incident, but we may not have time to go into that. But uh, you, you arrived in Okinawa and then your, your, your duties with the torch relay ended, right? And then the, ended, the, right. the torch relay went through all parts of Japan. Yes. Right? Um, so what was your job after the torch relay? What was uh, well, I kept uh, working for the same department, but other than torture relay, I worked as a personal assistant for IOC president at that time, every Brandage, whenever he came to Tokyo before and during the Olympics. I was just a naive young girl and <laughs> did not know or did not have uh, any knowledge or information about him. My boss just told me that he was like a king in IOC. So at first I was a little scared and nervous. However, despite his well dignified appearance, uh, he was a quiet, warm-hearted gentleman. And I gave him an overnight Japanese language lesson when it was decided that at the opening ceremony on October the 10th, he will solicit Emperor of Japan in Japanese to make opening remarks at the National Stadium. Well, considering the limited time for practice, I think he did a good job. <laughs> and um, many of me may, may not know about him, but he was a strong advocate of amateurism and fought against the commercialization of the Olympics. It is true that Olympic logo, as well as an Olympic emblem, were strictly prohibited to use for the commercial purpose at the time of 1964 Olympic. And also I did not know why so many art antique dealers visited his room <laughs> in hotel and showed him precious art objects. Later, I learned that his Asian art collection is regarded as one of the largest and most important one in the US. After he passed away, I was told that all his Asian collection were donated to the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Do you know yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. um, Avery Brundridge, some of you may know, was the head of the IOC for decades and you know, some people thought he was a powerful leader, but there are a lot of people who who didn't like him because he was very direct and and he was very authoritative in his ways. And I think, you know, you you said you were a little uh, intimidated by him. Intimidated, uh, yes, at first, uh, but now I I found out he's a nice gentleman. <laughs> a lot of people learned that afterwards, but you know, you mentioned he was a. Uh, an a, uh, expert in, in particularly Asian art, Chinese and, and Japanese in particular. He was a longtime collector. I think I told you this story um, just a few days before he left for Tokyo for the Tokyo Olympics. His house burned down because of the wildfire yes, yes. in California. And yes, he lost yes. a lot, a big part of his collection. Uh, and so he was heartbroken. I, it's 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 hard to imagine what it was like because he was very proud to mm. host the first Asian Olympics, uh, and so you prepared him for the speech that he gave on opening day. But his heart must have been partially broken because he lost such a big part oh, of his collection yes. only a week but before. He, but he didn't show up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even he, so you didn't. You didn't know. Yet. Yeah. So you know when you think about. Uh, your time working in the Tokyo Olympic Organizing Committee, you know, what do you feel was the meaning 
of the Olympics and the Olympic torch relay to you and Japan? Okay, uh, let me talk about the meaning of the Olympic torch relay first. The members of the overseas Olympic torch relay mission made every effort not to extinguish the Olympic flame until the flame was passed on to the hand of the last runner, Sakai-kun, on the opening day. When I talk about my unforgettable experience in a passionate manner to my friends, they laugh at me and ask, what's so important? It's only fire. You can always light up again when it died out. But to me, the Olympic flame was a symbol of eternal peace and hope for humankind which should not die out no matter what happened. I think the fact that the torch relay passed through Asia was a strong a sign of strong determination that we should never start the war again. I hope uh, people in the world should keep remembering the true spirit of Olympic flame whenever and wherever the Olympic games are held in the future. And to me, uh, the 1964 Olympics left, well, in my heart, many private legacies also in the heart of Japanese people. For example, by setting up the common goal aiming at the success of Tokyo Olympics game, Japanese people were able to be united. And eventually we could enjoy the remarkable economic growth within a short period. At the same time, I think Japanese people could bring back their confidence and, and pride as a Japanese which had been lost by the World War II. And another example, I think that 1964 Olympic strengthened the international bond among peoples in the world. Although to my great regret, later on the world had to face the new kind of war between or among nations, not among nations, but among peoples from different regions and races. Do you know the copy, catch copy of the Tokyo Olympics in 1964? Well, it was in Japanese, Sekai wa hitotsu, Tokyo Olympic. One word, Tokyo Olympic. I believe that what happened in the closing ceremony symbolize this catch copy beautifully. It uh, accidentally, but very naturally happened that all athletes and officials came in flocks into the national stadium, mingling together, waving their hands to the emperor and the empress and VIPs, dancing their national dance, and bowing to the thousands of spectators with sign of gratitude. I was overwhelmed to witness this dramatic scene at the National Stadium. We were really in the one world. It was nothing like the gorgeous, money consuming and commercial oriented entertainment to be performed by the recent Olympics. And I like to uh, quote the saying of Baron Pierre de Coubertin who founded the modern Olympics in Athens, Greek in 1896. He quoted that the meaning of the Olympic is not to win, but to participate. Did I answer your question? <laughs> oh, you did. And uh, you ended that wonderfully. Uh, and uh, I'm, we're going to hand it now to Simon and 
And uh, we hope that there are other questions that are waiting for you uh, in the remaining time because uh, you have such wonderful memories and insight from that time. And we, we want to hear more. Right, Simon? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Kuno-san, thank you so much. You're welcome. I, I'm, I've, got, I've got lots of questions myself. Uh, wow. It, it's wonderful to, to, it's to, to easy. listen, <laughs> to, listen okay. to your recollections. Thank you. And Roy, thank you very much indeed. I, I wanted to... Roy, you mentioned right at the very beginning, Sakai Yoshinori, for example, and I'm, I'm so, so pleased that you showed Sakai Yoshinori's uh, entrance into the... Olympic Stadium. When I tell the story, when we do the tours in the exhibition that we have at Japan House Hundred, it is the one story which gets everybody every time the, that the realization. So, so thank you very much indeed for for highlighting that. And, and another another story that is that is, interests people a lot when they come to the exhibition is about Okinawa. And and I know Kuno-san, you you're you are accompanied the torch relay from India to Okinawa. And, and in the exhibition, we show a map of Japan from the official record of the Tokyo 1964 Olympic Games. And also from the official record, we have a photograph uh, which shows uh, the torch relay in Akita. But in that official record, the Torch relay is divided into two sections, the international section with all these beautiful photographs from Olympia uh, all the way across Asia. And then there is the domestic uh, record of all the pictures around the, the islands of, of, of Japan in, in the four routes. And then between the international section and the domestic section, there is this shorter but, but 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 quite comprehensive section of pictures showing the torch relay in Okinawa. Uh, and and this is always very interesting to people that it's neither in the international section and it's neither in the domestic section as such. And I wanted maybe if you could tell us a little bit about your recollections of that time when you were in fact in Okinawa. Okay, uh, as you may know that only in 1972, Okinawa was uh, Okinawa was returned back to Japan. So um, when I landed in Okinawa, the first thing I saw was the American flag, which gave me very mixed feeling. But next, when I saw uh, red and white Japanese flag and all those excited Okinawan people, I was overwhelmed with joy. As you know, Okinawa was still occupied and the Japanese flag was not allowed to be flown. But on that day, when torch relay, uh, no flame and torch uh, arrived, no flame arrived in Okinawa, the special permission was granted by the US authority just for the day. So Okinawa has such a sad history before they became independent. Thank you. Thank you answer my, your question. <laughs> Absolutely, the, the, this, this, the, there are pictures very much with, with the, the, of Japanese mm -hmm. flags flying in, in Okinawa at this time. So you, you've put a, a wonderful context on it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We, we have a question here that's come from one of uh, our viewers. It's from, from Helen McNaughton, uh, who I think you may know, Roy, already. She, she, she mentions, she says hello, and she says, thank you very much to Kuno-san for your fabulous recollections. <laughs> it's a question to you, Kuno-san. Hi. As you reflect back on Tokyo 1964 and your role, what impact do you think it had on your life? For example, did this role lead to other work operate opportunities for you, or maybe uh, a career? Well, yes. Um, I was kind of um, wondering what I should be after the university, but I jumped into the job in the Olympic Committee because it fascinated me. But 
uh, I was thinking to go to uh, graduate school in the United States, but because I work for the organizing committee, I think other than torture relay or working for the brandage, uh, I learned how to organize the project. So uh, that influenced my later career, like organizing some, um, what is that? What I'm, what I, uh, Nihongo de i desu ka? Tsuyaku onegai shimasu. Ano, Olympic de hataraita toyu keiken ga, sono ato no watakushi no shigoto ni okki na eikyo o ataeta to omoimasu. Tiyu na, atakushi wa ima, Nichibe Kyokai toyu, ano, non-profit organization de え、仕事をしています。そこではやっぱりいろいろなプロジェクトをオーガナイズ、あの、しかもあの、なんて言うんでしょう。え、日本とアメリカ、え、国際的なプロジェクトをオーガナイズしております。多分それはオリンピックで
Yes. It's too bad. And I think they will tear down the highway in future so that we will see the real Nihon Japan Bridge. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have we have another a question here from somebody uh, uh, who's been watching about it's about the opening ceremony again it's actually about Sakai Yoshinori Ag again. Uh, Kuno-san, did you did you witness the opening ceremony, and and uh, yes. what what did you what did you think at the time? Well, um, I was concerned about the flame. <laughs> 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 Sakai sends hand, and I just pray, please run safely in six minutes so that flame won't die out. And he did a wonderful job. And um, as I said in my uh, answer to Roy, that I hold the uh, spare flame holder like a baby. So when I saw the Sakai san with the uh, sacred flame, I was almost uh, cried with joy and I felt relieved to, from my mission. And, um, and all the spectac spectators were just excited about watching the you know, sacred frame blaming, um, burning to the sky. And it was fantastic. And um, I never forget that scene. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that that is all we have time for today. Um, unfortunately, time has already uh, run away with us. Uh, I could I could listen to your stories for such a long time, Kuno-san. I um, definitely it, it's it's wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for for allowing us to 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 hear your stories and and for sharing them with us um and i know it's late in japan now so thank you so much for for staying up with us thank you roy as well for for that i i have to thank you roy very much indeed for 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 putting this context together for for bringing us together here today uh they're extraordinarily valuable we have we have one more uh gallery tour coming at the last weekend of the exhibition coming up and Kuno-san I, I will recommend to everybody that they they watch this. I wish uh, I could go and see. <laughs> oh I wish you could be there you'd be the star of the show that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So before we end we uh, we, we have uh, a, a few announcements about Japan House. Uh, those of you who've attended today, you will get a, a feedback questionnaire by email. So please do fill that in. That will help us to continue doing these events in the future. As I mentioned, we have our exhibition. It's the last week. It's Tokyo 1964, Designing Tomorrow. You will be able to see many things that both Roy and Kuno-san have mentioned in, in, in their discussion today in that exhibition, including the torch, the torch holder, the, the torch relay uh, uniform and pictures of, of the torch relay itself. Uh, so to, please do come along if you can. We will also be screening uh, Tokyo Olympiad by Ichikawa Kon. That's uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, the 3rd of November, and also Saturday, the 6th of November. You mentioned that, Roy, the very beginning, this dramatic and uh, opening to the film about the destruction of old, old Tokyo to make way for the Olympic Games. Uh, that's free of charge. If you would like to come and see that, please do. We uh, also have our exhibition Connect, Individual and Group. This is by Tokuro Asao. He is the designer of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic logos. And he have a special exhibition of his work over the last 20 years uh, here in Japan House on all three floors. Uh, please do come and have a look if you may. On um, Connected with that on Friday, we also have an ex, uh, we have a, an event called Connecting Art and Science. That's Japan House London with the University of Tokyo. Uh, at the moment, Tokoro Asao uh, has an exhibition uh, from Komaba Museum in the University of Tokyo. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Connect, and he will be in conversation with origami engineer at the University of Tokyo, uh, Associate Professor Tachi Tomohiro. 
We also have an online exhibition tour with Tokoro-san. Unfortunately, he hasn't been able to join us in London. So on, on Tuesday, uh, the 9th of November, we will ha be having an online tour with Tokoro-san uh, around the exhibits at Japan House. Uh, please do sign up for that if you wish to see. We are also continuing our work with Sakai City uh, from, from Osaka, and we are holding an online event on Thursday, the 11th of November, called Sharpening Japanese Knives. This is a masterclass with Sakai City's Yamatsuka Mitsuo, who is a professional sharpener. Thank you very much indeed. Once again, Roy, thank you for bringing us all together. Thank you. It's, it's much appreciated. And thank you, Kuno-san, thank you, thank you so much. We've enjoyed listening to your recollections immensely. I wish we could listen to them more and hopefully, hopefully we will be able to see you again in person, maybe in London. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank much you. indeed. Thank you, thank you both.